Hi, I'm Naima. It's been two years since I developed severe long COVID symptoms. And despite there being over 100 million people around the world who have had or have long COVID, we still have a lot more questions than answers. This video is a summary of the main findings of long COVID. It's a look at what we know now two years in. I'll start by talking about who is impacted, then I'll move on to the causes, the different subcategories of the illness, and lastly I'll move on to management and treatment. Remember I'm not a doctor but someone who is following long Covid very closely to try and make sense of this indecipherable illness. Long Covid is an invisible illness that comes with up to 203 symptoms. Obviously most people don't have 200 plus symptoms, thank goodness, but they tend to have a cluster of multiple symptoms, ranging between 5 to 20 per person. The most common are fatigue, cognitive dysfunction or brain fog, chest pains, insomnia, palpitations, dizziness, joint pain. An important thing to note as well is that this is a dynamic illness, whereby severe Severity and types of symptoms can vary quite dramatically. And this makes it very difficult to socialise, work and commit to plans. And that's why long COVID impacts every facet of your life, from socialising, relationships, work, because you never know what body you're going to wake up with. There are currently over 100 million people around the world who have or have had long COVID. In the UK, it's between 2 to 3 million people. In the US, 23 million people. And in Europe, 17 million in the European Union. The World Health Organization estimates that between 10 to 20% of people who contract COVID will develop a variety of mid and long term effects that can last for months or even years. You might be at higher risk of long COVID if you were hospitalised during your acute infection, especially if you were admitted to the ICU. You have a high number of symptoms during the infection. You have a female sex. You have a higher than average BMI. You have asthma. You have poorer health on infection if you have pre-existing conditions before getting COVID. But ultimately, this is a very complicated picture and we don't yet have all of the knowledge that we need to make a clear determination of who is most likely to be impacted. There are so many times I've been having a really bad symptom week, unable to get out of bed. I have felt so hopeless and I have thought to myself and wondered, why me? How could this happen? What happened in my body to mean that I've had such a severe reaction to this illness and everyone around me seems to be recovering in just a few weeks. What is going on here? We're starting to close in to a few of the causes of long COVID. First off, direct tissue damage or organ damage that is caused by an acute infection. So damage to the body's organs are common in people who are admitted to the hospital with COVID, as well as damage to the lungs and heart kidneys. In a recent study, about one eighth of people who had been hospitalised were found to have heart inflammation as well. Autoimmunity is another theory. There has been a lot of debate about whether long COVID could be an autoimmune disease. And so the infection coincides with the creation of autoantibodies and other features of autoimmune diseases. These autoantibodies recognise and interfere with the body's own proteins, DNA and other molecules. So they also contribute to persistent inflammation. There are lots of questions that we still need to uncover in this theory, including whether long COVID is an autoimmune condition. Can COVID trigger a secondary autoimmune disease? Lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Disruption of the microbiome is something that you might have heard about as well recently when it comes to long COVID. There is a growing body of evidence implicating the gut microbiome. So all of the bacteria, fungi and other microbes that inhibit the, the digestive tract could all be impacted depending on COVID severity. And because the gut plays a major role in immunity, it also affects the recovery process. Another interesting theory is around latent viruses. A latent virus occurs when the viral 
RNA or DNA remains in the cells of the body after the initial infection. So viruses can remain in the body for years without prompting any symptoms at all. And during the viral reactivation, these dormant latent viruses switch back on and the virus is capable of replication and can cause symptoms on the host. So common latent viruses are Epstein-Barr, herpes type 1 and 2 and Lyme as well. Last but not least, viral persistence is becoming the most dominant theory now, whereby people with long COVID have persistent viral expression. So there was a recent study that showed PCR positivity of COVID in, in nasal or stool samples. So even after the symptoms have cleared, the virus still has persistent presence and there's replication of SARS-CoV-2. So it's definitely possible and, and quite likely that there are a combination of these things at play. And these causes create different types of responses. We used to categorise COVID long haulers into three groups. Mild disease, not hospitalised was one. Hospitalised and admitted to ICU. But this doesn't get you very far in understanding the different presentations of the disease. I kind of like Gez Medinger's categorizations from the Long COVID Handbook, where he divides us into three groups. The first one is increased intolerance to food, allergies, rashes, headaches, breathing problem and gut issues. The second one is brain fog, fatigue, post-exertional malaise and cognitive exhaustion. And the final one is increased heart rate or palpitations, nausea, dizziness, especially on standing, insomnia, anxiety, chest pain, vision problems and irregular temperature regulation. So you can also be part of all three groups or just two or one. I think I was initially part of all three and now I'm only part of the second and third one. Yay me, there's some progress. The most frustrating thing about this condition is that we're still in the very early days of exploring treatments for long COVID. But I'll summarise the main possible treatments that are currently being explored. Anti-inflammatories, for example, colchicin. So this is a drug that is commonly used to treat gout, but it can also be effective with pericarditis or myocarditis, so sharp inflammation around the heart. I've been using it for about two months now and it's definitely helping to resolve some of my chest pains. Antihistamines. There's been a recent study exploring the use of antihistamines in long COVID. This study showed some pretty promising results apart from on dysautonomic symptoms. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy or HBOT. This is one of the things that is most mentioned in the comments on this channel as a potential treatment. It involves getting into a tank in which the atmospheric pressure is raised and there is much more oxygen than in the air. So this causes you to breathe in a lot more oxygen. It comes at a significant expense and usually it's recommended that you do about 10 sessions to see the full effects. And there's been a small study in the UK so far. Antiviral. So this fits into the theory that if, if there we have viral persistence and that is what is causing long COVID, then antivirals could be an effective treatment of this illness. The main ones include Paxlovid, which is a combination of nirmatrelvir and ritonavir. Another one is molnupiravir. molnupiravir. These, are, these are a real mouthful. So I'm watching developments really closely. Anecdotally, I've heard good things on the long COVID support groups, but some of these drugs have a lot of interactions with with a lot of other drugs. So it's important to consult a doctor. Mar Maraviroc and Pravastatin, these are antiretroviral drugs that are typically used for HIV. Slightly more obscure, but I have heard, I have heard those two mentioned quite a lot. And there are a few studies going on at the moment as well. Ivermectin. So this was a very contentious and popular discussion point in the long COVID community about this time last year. We were one year in and we wanted to get our hands on anything that could help us. It is a drug that is normally used for worming horses, but it has antiviral and anti-inflammatory benefits. I've heard of it being used both during the acute phase and for long COVID as well. It's not something that is being administered in the UK or Europe at the moment. Lastly, low-dose naltrexone. Naltrexone is normally used to help people overcome an opioid addiction. In very low doses, 
it can function as a painkiller and an anti-inflammatory. There are currently several studies that are happening at the moment and I'm watching this one very, very closely. Given that there is no treatment for long COVID at the moment, many of us have gone down the management route or that is the advice that we've been given by doctors at this point in time to learn to manage this illness by doing as much as we can to alleviate and stabilise symptoms while we wait and hope that with time we recover or that a treatment will become available. So here are some of the things that you can do in no particular order. Rest, so scheduling times to rest throughout the day. That means taking time away from screens, from TV, phones, and sitting in a dark room for 15 to 45 minutes, depending on how much rest you need, every couple of hours. Pacing, so this involves lowering the amount of activity that you do to find your baseline. Your baseline is the amount of activity that you can do without worsening your symptoms. That involves keeping a detailed capture of what you're doing every day, so that you can start to notice patterns and see what triggers you might have with your illness. And then slowly getting to the point where you can stabilize your amount of activity and then hopefully you start to see some improvements. Calming the autonomic nervous system. So I have a whole video on this because for me it's been an absolute game changer. Breath work, yoga nidra, anything you can do to calm the nervous system. Because with dysautonomia we tend to be disproportionately in fight or flight mode. When you're in that mode you're not able to heal, rest, digest. It's all about getting your body into a more relaxed state. Diet, there are a lot of diets out there including anti-inflammatory, low histamine diet, low FODMAP, all of these different types of diets are things that are worth trying as well as what I like to do is fasting as well so I only eat within an eight hour window so between 12 and 8 um, and that gives my body some time to rest and not be constantly digesting food and management of dysautonomia last but not least. So this could include increasing salt intake, electrolyte, compression clothing which I have on right now and beta blockers which I've been on now for over a year and they have helped keep my heart rate low and stable. We are at a really important inflection point in long COVID research and given the number of people who are impacted we refuse to be ignored. I've been overwhelmed and so thankful by all of the comments and messages that I've received for my last few videos. It's made me feel so much less alone in trying to decipher this confusing illness. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next one.